Anyway, yeah, so thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. Um, and I'd just like to sort of cover a few of the uh, projects that we're involved in, many of them are GRDC funded, as Christian mentioned. Um, and most of them now, the current ones, are really related to what's going on around in the field trials and the paddocks at the moment, you know, so all the uh, soil incorporation or uh, soil machinery and incorporation equipment. So basically, uh, some, of, some of the innovative uh, techniques we use at UniSA. Just a bit of background um, to, to add to what Tristan mentioned. Um, the group I work with has been around for about 35 years. We've always been involved with uh, seeding and tillage equipment, grain harvesting equipment, and also post-harvest processing and uh, quality of grains and fruits and things. We've always had a close linkage with industry, um, and we've worked with uh, many field um, farm groups and extension groups over the years. In recent times, um, computer simulation has really come to the forefront, so the computer capacity that we have and the, the software that we have available has really enabled us to um, use simulation as a tool to um, pre-validate uh, machinery and, and what we do in the paddock, so I'll talk to you about that in a second. <clears throat> as I said, uh, involved in many GRDC projects at the moment, and that has been a, a, a steady funding source for us to carry out our research. But we also have funding from SAGIT, the local uh, SADI, PERSA. Um, I have involvement now with the Department of Ag in WA. So there's many funding sources that come um, to us, or you know, that we work with for our research. So just to um, cover off on some of the current projects, um, you might be familiar with some of these. They're, they're all GRDC, well, mostly GRDC funded. So the um, DAW002044 is about improving crop performance on non-wetting soils in, in WA. Um, and that's all about um, burying that non-wetting surface layer. Um, working with Stephen Davies closely there, and some of you would have seen his uh, work and publications. Uh, the next project is the SA-based GRDC CSIRO project, which is looking at improving pro production on sandy soils in the southern region. And that project, as you may well know, covers from here on the EP all the way through to southern New South Wales. Um, running alongside that project is one run out of Degetar in Victoria, which is about ameliorating subsoils. So in the high rainfall zone, subsoil constraints are more of an issue than uh, sort of the surface layer, um, and we're involved in that project as well. I guess running alongside those two projects is the PERSA, what was the New Horizons project uh, that we've been involved in for a few years now, and we're looking at engineering solutions there for some of those subsoil technologies and, and equipment. Um, and that sort of complements really both of those GRDC projects working with sandy soils and subsoil constraints. Uh, at the moment, I'm in the process of signing up uh, an agreement with another DAFWA project looking at the um, inclusion plates, the topsoil slotting plates, with um, Wayne Parker out of DAFWA as well. Uh, and I really think that sort of complements the whole stream of machinery that we're concerned with at the moment through... Um, you know, non-wetting soils on the surface, burying weed seeds, herbicide-resistant weed seeds, um, looking at mixing organics into the profile, and then looking at getting organics down into the deeper profile into those subsoils. And uh, obviously in WA they're using these um, topsoil sliding plates to do that. So um, I guess you'll see from the range of projects we are involved across the board. Um, and what we add to the projects, I guess, is the machinery component. And that's about understanding what machinery is available, understanding how we use that machinery, and then trying to help improve its use and improve its um, sort of effectiveness. So if we look at the project specifically, um, this is a typical problem, obviously everyone would know. Um, lots of mobile ploughing happening in WA for the last sort of four or five years now. Um, but inconsistent burial of perhaps that topsoil layer, which is the non-wetting, has the weed seeds, um, and not as effective as what they would have liked. So what we got involved for was to look at how we could perhaps help farmers improve that ploughing operation. Uh, improving the setup, choice of plough, uh, some of the operation char characteristics, um, and then maybe some design additions or modifications down the track. So this has been going for a couple of years now. Um, it just happens that, yeah, as um, Tristan mentioned, I studied my PhD in the UK, and I actually studied the mobile plough 15 years ago, so it's just kind of like a whole reinvention for me. <laughs> um, in terms of the Sandy Source project here in, in SA, uh, obviously it's looking at improving the constraints in sandy soils, and they are physical, chemical, and nutritional, or biological. Um, and it's really got two focuses. 
One is mitigation practices, which aims to improve in the sort of short term, annually, um, the inherent potential of the soil. And for that, we're looking at machinery which will help with um, seeding systems, uh, fertility strips on row, um, and, and again, ways to manage perhaps non-wedding in some cases or um, that surface uh, layer. The second approach is to look at amelioration, which is that major intervention that we might only do once and hope it's going to last 10 years. Um, so in that respect, we're looking at the staining and perhaps the ripping and, the, and maybe the plowing as well. So they're the machinery sort of components um, for those. The uh, Degetar project, now this is about the machinery needed to get this product down to depth into the profile, where that uh, B horizon may be three or four hundred millimetres below the surface. There's a really constrained clay layer. Um, there's been a fair bit of work in the past looking at machines, um, like this sort of machine here, and I think um, the uh, yeoman's plough that's been around the area tried some work. Hopper-based systems, you put a product into the hopper, pellets or compost if you're trying that sort of thing. You're trying to get that product down behind a tyre and get it deep into the profile. Many engineering problems with this. Most of the machines that have been tried have limitations um, and, and constraints. And that's one of the things that we're sort of working on at the moment. So, um, yeah, the, the designs of hoppers, if, if a hopper is the best place to put that product, um, how the product flows out of that, what the metering system is, and then there's alternatives that are starting to be looked at. So this sort of in paddock, in crop um, machine that can harvest the crop from the, the location and just feed it through and pass it down into the, into the soil profile. And again, this is a prototype developed by Melbourne Uni and Southern Farming Systems. Uh, it's in a prototype stage, it's in its infancy and there's still some problems with that. In terms of how kind of the PERSA project overlaps on that, or our component of the PERSA project, um, what machinery is available? As I've said, this hopper-based system is, is currently the, the, the sort of norm. Um, there's been development of some bigger systems trying to scale it up to you know, broad acre capacity, um, again, with some limitations. Basically, a lot of the issues with this, apart from handling different a range of products, is the cost. Um, the cost of that machinery, the output rates, um, the power it takes to, um, to pull these tines in the ground. So in terms of a, a better solution, reduced power requirements, increasing the work rates and improving the uniformity of application over a wider range of products is something that uh, we believe is important. And um, our focus for the next couple of years is going to be looking at a new sort of uh, a, new, uh, a, new approach, yeah, a new approach to um, how we apply a range of organic materials and how we incorporate those materials uh, to depth in the profile. <coughs> Finally, um, the DAFWA project, as I said, the inclusion plate project. So as you would be aware, there's quite a bit of work going on in WA with uh, topsoil slotting or inclusion plates. Um, these are basically a set of plates that have been added behind ripper tines. There's not been any real um, design or testing gone into these plates at the moment. So Agroplow, Ozplow, and I think uh, Newfab Tilco are producing inclusion plates. Um, quite fast adoption in WA, but also some limitations too. So most of the users are finding a huge draft penalty by adding inclusion plates. So as they're trying to rip wider, they're going to CTF systems on 9, 12 metres. Um, adding inclusion plates then means they can't pull their ripper at you know, the depth they want. Um, also, soil sort of sticking or smearing on the sides uh, in different soil moisture, soil conditions, different effects over soil types, and also handling trash. Um, so, through our involvement in this project, we're initially going to be looking at um, the draft force penalty as a, as a constraint, and then we'll be looking at how we deal with uh, larger volumes or uh, different materials from the surface down into that uh, slot behind the time. At the moment, most of this work, uh, most of the inclusion is based on getting rid of that non-wetting sand or getting lime or something, uh, a powder down into that slot. And obviously that uh, organic top layer as well. Um, so they haven't been really used for anything, you know, um, like an, uh, an amendment material. <coughs> So how do we approach some of this stuff? 
discrete element method is a computer simulation that, uh, that we've started using in the last five years. Um, we had a PhD student start it uh, yeah, six or seven years ago that worked on some fundamentals of the software. And we saw a huge application in it in terms of being able to simulate a machine, understand what a machine does in a soil type, and then based on that information, improve the operation of that machine or improve the understanding at least, and say to, you know, an output, as an output say, um, you know, that machine could be improved, it could do a better mixing job, it could do a better burial job. Um, and this really sort of started when I was talking with uh, Stephen Davies about non-wetting sands and the problem they were having in burying that, or complete burial of that non-wetting layer. So discrete element, element method is basically um, a bunch of particles that are added together to create a bulk. So simplicity, simplicity here, um, just a few particles, but they are all joined together, and that acts like a bulk material. They are able to be moved, they're able to be um, compressed, they're able to be split apart. And they're basically controlled by fundamental laws of physics, um, and the interactions of these particles are calculated every time step in the simulation, so that the computer knows where that particle goes. And I'll show you some videos later. So this is quite a powerful uh, technique uh, for us in the, in the lab or in the workshops or in the, in the offices um, and it allows us to start a process of understanding without having to go and do a field trial. So we all know that you know, we could go to the field and do testing but that's often limited by weather, by seasons, by whatever it may be and availability of land. <coughs> One of our um, key requirements, I guess, with that simulation is making sure that the simulation space is actually, re actually representing the soil that we're concerned with in the paddock. And that's the major concern, or the major um, challenge, because you'll all know that soils are so different. Uh, we have uh, different types of soil, textures, um, compositions, whatever, and then we have different soil moistures, we have organic matter you know, uh, mixed in with it, we have lots of variables. But um, as a starting point, we need to calibrate. And one of our calibration methods is using the angle of repose. And that's a technique where you just have a, a loose sample of soil, you pour it through a funnel, um, and it falls into a pile. And the natural angle at, that, at which that soil sits is known as the angle of repose. And that's a useful test for us to determine how the soil should flow when it's being moved by a, a tillage machine, a piece of equipment. What we can do then is, um, Oops, sorry, wrong way. What we can do then is actually measure this angle. So that's a, a picture, an image that we've taken of a, a soil sample from one of the sandy soil sites in New South Wales, I believe. Um, and we are concerned with this angle at which the soil is sitting. Um, so we use image analysis now, so we get a consistent measure of that soil angle, and we can then replicate that in our simulation space. When we replicate that with the variables in the simulation, we know that the soil will move in a similar way to what it will in the paddock at that condition that we've tested it. So here you can see the effect of moisture on angle of repose. So um, an Olean soil, so an Olean trial site that we're involved with at the moment um, for the Sunny Tools project. This is a high moisture sample and this is a low moisture sample. So the difference in angle of repose means that the soil acts differently when it's wet, when it's dry. So we need to be able to replicate that in our simulation space because we want the, you know, if we're running a ripper tine through it or running a spader through it and it's, a, and it's a wet soil, we need to make sure that that's represented well in the simulation space. So you can see quite, quite a large uh, variability in the uh, angle there of the soil at different moistures. <coughs> The table is probably not going to mean too much anyway, but basically using that angle of repose as a, as a comparison between um, real soil and the simulation, we have a range of variables that we can change. So this is like a, a complex list of uh, interaction parameters that each of those particles has. So the way those particles act together is controlled by this, these contact parameters. Um, and really we have either from the literature or from testing um, or from um, standards, we can define most of these parameters, but there's a couple like rolling friction and cohesion energy density, which we use in the simulation space, that actually control this angle. So what we'll do by trial and error, we'll measure the soil, we'll measure the soil sample first of all, and then by trial and error, we'll run a simulation and get the same angle uh, by changing these um, <coughs> parameters. 
That means that then when we put our equipment and machine into that uh, simulation space, we think that the, or we understand that the soil is going to be acting the same. Some of the other challenges in the simulation space are the size of these particles and the size of the simulation. So here you can see if we have a relatively small tool, so say a, a narrow knife point opener, and we have relatively large particles, we don't get much interaction across the width of that, uh, that blade. If this was a moldboard plow here, then these particles would probably be an okay size. Due to computational limitations, we are, we are unable to use particles that are actually part of, uh, like grains of sand or um, you know, that particle size. So we have to use bigger particles. But we have to consider the size of the particle in relation to the size of the geometry. What this means is our simulations end up with a large number of particles in them. So this has got 1.4 million, um, and that's only a few meters long with the one single time. So when we get to looking at the whole machine operation, um, you know, I'll show you in a second how big these simulations can get. The other thing we have to consider is when we, um, so say this is a starting point on the left hand side here, if we're running our simulation along here, it takes a little bit of time to get up to a, an equilibrium. So you know, when you, put, when you first drop your cedar into the ground, the soil starts to flow, but it doesn't get to a consistent flow rate until you've gone a few meters down the paddock. And we have exactly the same scenario here, because this, the simulation is acting like the soil does. <coughs> The types of things that we're looking at, so complementing the project I talked about earlier, the types of things that we're looking at are loosening, inversion, mixing, and incorporation. Um, so we're able to set up simulations that can look at these aspects of physical soil movement um, that, that helped us to understand the machinery being used in the project. Um, this can help to, to improve the setup of machinery, to understand the operation of that machine and what it's effect or what effectively it can do, and then down the track probably improve the design. So here's just a simple straight leg um, time or seed opener, looking at how those layers get mixed um, from deep to the surface. And some of you be familiar with uh, James Barr's work on the bent leg opener, uh, and this is one of his sort of uh, quick animations. Um, and then down the bottom here, we've got a plow simulation and a spader simulation, which are both related to the projects I've talked about. And I'll go to more of those in a second. So if we look at uh, the work we've been doing with mobile plow for the, the WA work. Um, so I've talked about how we set up our soil simulation space in terms of the particles and the parameters of getting those correct. We also need to have the geometry. So uh, we're working here with full-scale geometry, so we're not, we're not working with scaled-down stuff, so that's a, a full-scale plow. Um, we actually had to go and measure some of the geometry of this one. We got some geometry from manufacturers in other cases, but uh, whichever way we get it, we need to have a real geometry. It comes in as a CAD model. We put that into the simulation space, and then because for the plow project we were concerned with that uh, burial of the surface non-wetting layer, we're actually using a blue sand layer, the same as uh, Cray Scanlan has used in WA to evaluate the field trials. So it's, it's using the same methods uh, to evaluate its performance. We uh, put blue sand layer across the surface, we run the plow through the simulation, and then we look at where that blue layer ends up in the profile. Um, so I think if that's going to work. Um. So this is um, real speed, or effective um, forward velocity, five kilometers an hour. Um, working depth of 300 millimeters an hour, uh, sorry, 300 millimeters, um, and 20 meter long bin. So we're, we're giving a chance to get up to a, a uniform um, soil movement. You can see the blue layer has been plowed through. Um, this is the rear view, and how the soil flows off of the moldboard. So in terms of the, um, issues they were seeing in WA, you know, this blue layer still being visible at the surface or near to the surface is their concern. Um, if that layer there has uh, weed seeds, they will still germinate. If that layer is non-wetting, um, you still have not some non-wetting in the surface uh, layer there. So you can see it's a really good uh, visualization of where the soil goes. You can watch how it's flowing off the moldboard. We can then run that for different speeds, different depths, different uh, moldboard setups. 
whatever it may be, and we can see how that uh, affects the burial of that top layer. So at this stage, that's our main, uh, in the plant project, that's our main interest, is looking at how that surface layer is buried, um, and, and then you can see how that's working. Just an idea of the simulation space, I said it's, it's uh, preferential to going out in the field, but this, this soil bin here, which was 20 metres long, had 2.3 million particles, and takes about 25 hours to simulate that plough running 20 metres. So it's a fairly high <laughs> computational requirement. Okay, you can look at the simulation. It's a pretty picture. How do we know that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing? We validate it in the field. So we have a plough here. On a, it's, not, it's only three furrow, not four furrow. We go to the field. We lay a trench of blue sand, and we plough through it. So we plough through the sand, and then we have to excavate. So everyone likes a soil pit. So we dig a hole as well. We get down to where our sand was. We work out where we started in terms of the um, furrow wall and then we scrape away a, a, a surface. We then can see where that sand's gone um, in the soil. We can then take an image of that, and we can then overlay that with our simulation so we can compare. And then we can validate if that's showing us what the soil actually does. So the, the dots here are pixels on the uh, image or they're uh, particles in the simulation space, so they're overlaid on top of each other. So the, the green ones <coughs> are the... Uh, silhouette of the plough, and then the blue ones are the field measurements, so a picture, an image, and that analysed to show where the sand was in the field, and the red ones are the simulation space. So if we just look at one comparison here, so the discrete element method versus an experiment, uh, percentage of blue sand left in the 0 to 100 millimetre layer, so within 3 or 4 percent here, simulation doesn't vary quite as much as you would have seen from the um, previous slide, that was where the soil is, the blue soil was near the surface still. A relatively good uh, sort of correlation to where the soil ends up in that soil profile. So concerning about getting rid of this layer on the surface and burying it to depth. Um, so as I mentioned, we're looking at how this can, uh, how the plough can affect soil burial well, at different operating depths. So we worked from 200, 250, 300, and 350. And then we can look at the percentages of that blue sand in each layer over the depth profile. What we can also do in the simulation space is work out how much force that takes. So you can see the increase in force as we increase from 200 millimeters to 350 millimeters. So these values are not going to mean much because this is a single furrow. Um, so yeah, but you can see the increase in force. And we all understand from um, Research, previous research that increasing in depth means it takes more force to pull it. Uh, in general, out of this, we can see that as you go uh, deeper, you get a bit better burial of that uh, surface layer. So 200 millimetres, you see you've still got 30% of that on the, on the 0 to 100 layer. When you get down to um, 350, you're down to 20% there and a higher percentage buried at 200 to 300 millimetres deep. If you look at that across the cross section, um, from left to right is the deep uh, setting through to the shallow setting. So when you're playing shallow, you actually that more of that um, more of that surface layer is left near the surface. And if you look at it in terms of uh, top down view, uh, as you go deeper, the material is moved forward more from that blue trench that was originally lay across the um, soil surface. If we look at the effect of speed, and again, forces, so as we go faster, the force goes up, but not as much, so going faster doesn't have as much of a draft penalty. Um, but again, uh, five kilometers an hour is the red one, so here we get very little left on the surface. If we go to 15 k's an hour with the plow, we've got 50% of that soil left on the surface. So going faster with the plow doesn't give us such a good burial. Okay, so it's got one of the key things. And then as you, as, the inverse of this uh, surface there, I guess, is what you get to full depth. So the slower you go, the more you get to full working depth. Um, and again, we're looking at across the section and top down. And again, uh, material carried much further forward when you go at high speeds, as you would expect. <coughs> Some of the things we can look at in terms of the design. So skimmer, 
the skimmer is a common addition to the plough, fits in front of the mouldboard, um, takes off a little chunk of that soil before the mouldboard turns the furrow. Um, what happens if you take that off or if you choose to use something different? There's trash boards, there's other, there's other adaptions. So we run the plough with the skimmer and without a skimmer. So without the skimmer in red, so you can see an extra 10% left on the surface layer, 0 to 100. So if your uh, non wetting sands or weed seeds are left in that top 100 mil, um, more likely to germinate, more likely to cause you problems in the cropping zone. Um, what the skimmer shows though is it doesn't actually benefit deep burial. So it may take more uh, material off the surface and get it down to say 200 millimetres, but it doesn't help burying it to full working depth because it's working on that top section. Uh, so, and again, looking at, um, yeah, two here for the skimmer, can't really see much difference in that one, with or without, um, but obviously the previous one showed that there was some depth. And then again, forces, so there's a slight increase in force by using the skimmer, but consider that would be beneficial in terms of the burial that you're achieving. If burial is the main objective, then that's what we want. Okay, so that was the plough work uh, in the simulation space and, and field validation. For the Sandy Soils project this year, we've been involved with a trial site at Oyen, and we've been looking at the spader. So uh, I understand from talking to a few guys last night, the spader's been used around here quite a bit. So you'd be familiar with this. Um, we've actually been talking with Farmax, and we've got this machine on loan for the project for three, four years. Um, and we're able to modify it and use it for field trials. One of the things we've done is uh, taken the outside wing off the outside blade so that we're working within the trial plot width. Um, and this is uh, Michael Moody from um, Moody Agronomy. Um, his setup that was implementing the trials at Owen this year. So this is his seeder system. Um, we've got uh, the seed tubes going down the back here, feeding the seed down behind the, the spader before the press wheels. That's the, um, what's happening in the paddock. What we're concerned with in the simulation space is how that spader is working. So again, we need to validate that. We need to make sure that we can set a simulation up for a soil type, for a soil moisture, for that Oyen soil type uh, that will give us a representative um, simulation. So we lay a bigger trench of soil because obviously the spader is a more uh, aggressive uh, interaction, carries soil forwards and backwards because the rotor is going around. So we have uh, two meters long by, this is I think six meters wide, so uh, five passes of the spader. Um, lay that on the surface, uh, 20, 30, 40 millimeters deep, whatever, how much sand we can get our hands on. Actually, how long it took us to mix it, mix up the blue color. Um, but we spade through that blue sand, and then we can excavate to have a look at where it's gone. Yeah, what? Yeah, nearly there. Um, okay, so this is uh, setting the spader up. This is our blue sand, that's excavating the pits. So again, that's our validation. And that's full size, full scale, uh, again, 15 meters long, I think, four, three meters wide, <coughs> spading through that blue sand layer. So what that enables us to do is look at the amount of mixing we get. So this is cross sections from the soil pit. So we can see the blue sand there, we've taken images of. These are sections taken out of the simulation space. So again, we can see the burial. Because this is a, a very small cross section, we see only a few particles in that space, but we can accumulate these together to show us where those particles end up. And that's what it looks like. So again, same way as with the plow, we have the blue, which is the soil images taken from the pits, and the red, which is our simulation space. So we can see here for 200 millimeters deep, three k's an hour, 200 millimeters deep, five k's an hour. So the faster we go, the less burial we're getting to full depth uh, in, in general terms. And if we look at 300 millimeters deep and three, um, three and five k's an hour again, so you can see we're getting the trend here, soil's being buried to full depth, um, go a bit faster. The blue field trials show here that we're not actually getting mixing to full 300 millimeters deep when we go faster. At 200 we're achieving it, at 300 perhaps we're not. So probably too much information on this slide, but um, here, here's a range of those um, validations about the percentages buried or mixed at each layer. And you'll see a little bit different here where we're probably getting more mixing in the, in the center of that profile rather than getting stuff to depth. And that's what we'd expect from a spader because we're not doing an inversion process, we're doing a mixing process. 
Um, so we're mixing that into that sort of mid-range profile from the surface, but still getting you know burial from the surface. And one of the interesting things to look at in this respect is what is happening over that layer. So here's our simulation space. We can see we can break this down into as many layers as we want. We've just chosen here 0 to 100, 100 to 200, and 200 to 300. So on the surface, this is the sort of scatter that we're getting from a top view. So we can see distribution there quite evenly over the, over the width, and, and not many particles left. Go down to that middle section, 100 to 200. We get a higher density of particles, uniformly mixed over that profile, quite good. And then if we go to a deeper depth, we're starting to see the, the blade lines, so where the rotor blades have actually passed. And we're not getting mixing across the, uh, the full profile. Now, we don't know at the moment, agronomically, uh, what, that, what that effect does, whether it's better to have a complete mixing over the full profile. So if you're working at 300 deep, you want uniform mixing over the whole width and the whole depth. Or whether uh, this type of mixing, when you get to the depth, you know, the working depth of the profile, is still going to give you that agronomic benefit, and that's hopefully something that's going to come out of the Sandy Soils project over the next couple of years. And just to finish off, um, I guess using this technique now, we can look at other things. So there's been some delving talked about already. Um, so we can we can look at delving deep profiles, um, how that material might get lifted from depth, come to the surface and how we might look at uh, improving that delving operation. So any machine that you can consider, if we can validate it with soil, go and get a soil sample, take moistures, density, whatever, calibrate it, run a simulation, we can understand how that machine's gonna work, what you're expected to find by using it. And then if you use that machine faster, slower, deeper, whatever, are you gonna improve this operation or are you actually gonna be a detrimental effect by, by doing that? So, thank you for your time and uh, I'll accept any questions. Thanks. Uh, well, we are looking at, so James Barr's project is looking at um, shallow soil movement with a bent leg opener. So we can actually put a, a treflin in there, but what we could do is put a particle that represents a, a treflin. The particle is not going to act the same as a liquid, obviously, because it's not going to absorb into the particles. But we can definitely look at um, sort of where you open up a, a furrow that doesn't have perhaps that topsoil layer in it. Okay, so like um, removing a non-wetting sand layer along the seed row, um, or where you get that soil thrown to the next seed row, and that's definitely part of the mitigation stuff that um, yeah, we're working on for uh, yeah, controlling treflan uh, incorporation. Yeah. yeah, no, not in this um, respect. Like the simulation is, uh, well, it's real time, but it, it's, um, yeah, it, it doesn't resettle like soil, I guess. Um, it, it obviously has gravity and all the mass of the particles and things, but we, we haven't left it for, say, weeks and weeks weeks to see what happens in terms of settlement. Um, potentially, you could see uh, you know, recompaction or resettlement, but it's not really, you know, we haven't looked at it. It would take too long, probably. Uh, well, we'll be publishing all of this in GRDC newsletters, uh, ground cover, um, wherever. So there's always, always been a couple of um, things go out of WA on the fly stuff. So there, there will be communications about it. Um, it's not something that a farmer's going to use. It's probably that app, the, um, the outcomes are going to be published in grower updates or whatever. Um, you know, James has presented at um, GRDC updates. I think we're going to be presenting next year at GRDC updates. Um, so yeah, there'll be plenty of communication coming out uh, over the next couple of years. <laughs>